Hello and welcome. In this class, we'll perform the configuration of these routers in the topology. So we're going to have four devices and three of them will have a local area network. So you will find the diagram just below the video and also the initial configuration for each of those devices. That basically is going to include only the IP addresses on the interfaces. So let's see how that configuration looks like at this point where I only have the IPs on every interface. So let's see here. So if I come here to R2, let's start with R1. So this device here is R1. You can see I only have two IP addresses. One IP that is connected in Ether1 and the second one connected in Ether2. So if I check the diagram, it's basically that interface here and Ether2 connected there. Just by having those two IP addresses, if I go to IP and then routes, you can see that we have two connected networks and we can see the DAC, dynamic, active and connected. If, for example, I disable one of those IPs, that entry is going to disappear because the router no longer has that connected network. If I enable that again, you can see that now we have that entry again. At this point, those networks are able to talk to each other, but uh, we have several remote networks. So now we are here in R1. R1 has four remote networks, non-connected networks. So it must explicitly provide the information for those networks. For all those networks, R1 is going to follow the same path. Basically, it's going to send the traffic to R2 to the IP 10.1.2.2. That is the interface on Ether1 in R2. So basically, we need two fields, the destination that is going to be each of those remote networks and the gateway that is going to be the IP in R2. So let's start with R1 and we're going to add all those remote networks. So the first network is going to be 10.2.3.0 slash 24. So let's go back to R1 routing table. We're going to add an entry. So the destination 10.2.3.0 2.3.0 slash 24. Gateway is going to be the same for all of them. And that is 10.1.2.2. The IP on Ether1 in R2. We can simply click OK. And now we have a static entry pointing to that remote network. I will add another entry for the next network. So in this case, this is going to be 10.3.3.0 slash 24. Gateway is the same, 10.1.2.2. So all the entries will be sending the traffic to that IP in R2. Okay, now the remote network number three, in this case, the one that is between R2 and R4, that is 10.2.4.0 slash 24, gateway 10.1.2.2. And finally, the LAN connected to R4, that is 10.4.4.0 slash 24, and the gateway, same IP, 10.1.2.2. So now, R1 knows about every remote network. But still, we need to add the remote networks to every router. So now we'll go to R2. R2 has three connected networks, and it's going to have three remote networks. So we need to add 10.1.1.0, like 24, 10.3.3.0 slash 24 and 10.4.4.0 slash 24. But in this case, R2 is going to be using different paths. If R2 is going to the network, we'll go in that way, basically to the IP in R1. If it's trying to reach that network, it's going to send the traffic in that way to that IP in R3. And if it's trying to go to that network, it's going to send the traffic to that IP in R4. So basically three different gateways because the traffic is going to flow through different paths. So let's go to R2 and let's perform that configuration. So now we're going here to R2, IP, routes. You can see that we have the three connected networks and we'll add one entry per remote network. So the first one is the LAN in R1. So the destination is 10.1.1.0 24. Please note that we are adding the network address and the mask, not the IP that is on R1. 
Then the gateway is an IP, and in this case it's 10.1.2.1, the IP that we have on iter1 in R1, because that's the interface that will be receiving the traffic from R2. So we have one static entry. Now let's go with the second remote network. So in this case, this is going to be the LAN network in R3, 10.3.3.0 24. And destination, R2 is going to send the traffic to R3. The IP on R3 that needs to be used is 10.2.3.2. That's the IP on R3 Ether 1. We can click OK. Now we are missing just one remote network, and that is the LAN connected to R4. So that is 10.4.4.0 slash 24. And in this case, R2 will send the traffic to R4. And that is 10.2.4.2. Now we have our routing table ready. Three static routes for the remote networks, three connected routes for the connected networks. So next step is going to R3. So now we'll go with R3. So it has two connected networks, and we're going to have, as you can see, four remote networks. To reach any of those remote networks, R3 is going to go in that way. The gateway is going to be the same for the four static routes, and they're going to be sending the traffic to 10.2.3.1, because all the traffic is going to be sent to R2, that's the next hub router. And we'll go with all those remote networks. So four static routes are required in R3. So let's go with the configuration in R3. So here we have, now this is R2. Let's go to R3. IP routes, only two connected networks. I will add the first one. This is the LAN in R1. So 10.1.1.0 slash 24. Gateway is going to be the same for all the routes because this is R3 sending the traffic to R2. So the gateway is 10.2.3.1. Okay. Next static route. Now is the network between R1 and R2. That is 10.1.2.0 slash 24. And the gateway is still the same. Routers 2, Ether 2. 10.2.3.1. One. And okay. The next one is the network between R2 and R4. So we are going to add an entry going to 10.2.4.0 slash 24. And the gateway is R2 Ether 2 because all the traffic will be sent to that IP on router 2. That is 10.2.3.1. And okay. We are missing only one network and that is the LAN network connected to R4. And that's 10.4.4.0 slash 24. Gateway is always R2 because R3 will be sending all the traffic to R2. 10.2.3.1. And okay. So now R3 has all the information. Two connected networks and four remote networks. The last router is going to be R4. Step number one, we need to identify the connected networks. Step number two, we need to identify the remote networks, all the non-connected networks. Step, we need to identify the next hub. So the next hub is that IP in R2, that is going to be 10.2.4.1, because to reach any of those remote networks, the traffic is going to flow through R2. So now we know that we are going to require four static routes and all of those remote networks will be using 10.2.4.1 as gateway. So let's go to R4 and after completing that uh, configuration, we are going to have full IP connectivity in our network. And then we can perform the test between devices connected in the network. So let's go to R4. So now R4 has only two networks. Then we can go to IP routes. We'll add an entry. We'll start going to the LAN connected to R1, that is 10.1.1.0 slash 24. Gateway, this is the IP on R2 that is facing R4, 10.2.4.1. 
Next one, the network between R1 and R2. That is 10.1.2.0 slash 24. Gateway, again, is the same, 10.2.4.1. Now we're going to add the, the LAN network connected to R3. That is 10.3.3.0 slash 24. And the gateway is 10.2.4.1. And finally, the network that is between R2 and R3. And that is 10.2.3.0 slash 24. And the gateway is 10.2.4.1. So now we have all those networks. We have every router with information about all the networks in the topology. Some with connected networks, some with static networks. And that is something that is required to have full IP connectivity. And now we need to test. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to set IP addresses in those devices according to the diagram. I have console access to those devices. So I will go to PC1 here, and to add an IP in that virtual PC, I can simply type IP, then the IP and mask, that according to the diagram, this is going to be 10.1.1.10, and then the mask, slash 24, space, and then we can type the gateway. So the gateway is the IP on the router, so in this case is 10.1.1.1. So now, we have IP, we have mask, and we have a gateway in the device. Show IP, so you can see the IP, mask, and gateway. So let's do the same with PC2. So PC2 is connected to R4. So we are going to add the IP that we see in the diagram, 10.4.4.4 slash 24. And gateway is the LAN in R4, 10.4.4.1. And finally, we are going to do the same with PC3 that we have here. PC3. IP in this case is 10.3.3.3 slash 24. Gateway 10.3.3.1. And now we have devices connected to the respective local area networks pointing to the router's IP. And the router has information about the connected networks, has information about the remote networks. So now, Every router is able to send the traffic to the next hub router. So let's try to ping from that PC on router 3 to that PC in router 4. So if I try to ping 10.4.4.4, so you can see that we have IP connectivity. Basically, the traffic is going from PC3 to R3. R3 is going to check the routing table. And it's going to find an entry. So if we see here router 3. It's going to come to the routing table. and going to say, okay, this packet is going to an IP that belongs to that network. Basically, going to send the traffic to 10.2.3.1. That is R2. And then here we have R2. R2 is going to receive that packet. And it's going to check the routing table. And it's going to see that information. So this packet is going to that network, so we're going to send the traffic to 10.2.4.2. That is basically R4. Then R4 is going to check the routing table, and it's going to see that this is a connected network, and that device is reachable out of Ether2. And basically it's going to deliver the packet out of that interface where that PC is connected. And that's why we have IP connectivity. If I send traffic to 10.1.1.10, also that is going to work. So let's see ping 10.1.1.10. You can see that we have IP connectivity. If you want to see all the hubs, we can use trace route. So in the case of this virtual PC, we can use this command trace. For example, if I type trace and then 10.1.1.10, this is going to show all the hubs in the path. You can see that the first hop is R3, the next hop is R2, next hop is R1, and finally that has reached that device. And that's why we have IP connectivity. So this is how static routing works. If any of the routers is missing a route, then we can have trouble if the packet is reaching the device because that device is not going to have information and going to drop that packet. 
So with static routing, we need to manually add information about all the networks to every device in the topology. And that's why this is challenging. You have a big network, static routing most likely is not going to be your best option. If we have a pretty small topology, we can manage static routing with no problems. But if we start adding a lot of devices, a lot of networks, then static routing can bring a lot of headaches. In that case, we are going to use dynamic routing protocols. Or if we have redundancy, for example, if I add a new link here between R3 and R4, just to have a backup path, also that can bring a lot of problems if we are using static routing, because if one link is going down, there is no way for the rest of the routers to know about that change. That's something that a dynamic routing protocol is going to do by using messages to update about that link going down to their neighbors and routers in the domain. But this is how you will implement static routing. The final configuration on the router is also posted. So you can get the initial configuration, the final configuration, but it that you can try to perform all the configuration by yourself. I hope that this class has been informative for you. In our next class, we'll start analyzing some of the additional fields that we have in a static route that can help to tweak our configuration. Thank you, and I see you in the next one.